Okay, so we're going to start today by taking this glass rod and tying it in a knot. Ready? No, we're not ready. We're going to have safety glasses. Why do we need safety, Why do we need safety glasses? It's going to break because glass is brittle. So I want to show you that we can take glass and process it. I put gloves on too for this. I'm a theorist, so every time I touch fire, there's a lawyer by the phone. <laughs> uh, no, really. <laughs> uh, and this is just a standard glass rod. Chemists call it a stirring rod. I call it a uh, demo material. Soft. And there we have a glass fiber. And this glass fiber is probably already cool. Yep, it is. Mine are off. I always turn that the wrong direction. Uh, and I can take my glass fiber, break it. Here and here. Fingers don't fumble so much, I'll tie it into a knot. There. Oh. Got an overhand knot. So, <laughs> tying glass into a, a rod. Now, the reason we were able to do that is because we changed the structure. We changed the structure in as much as we took it from a, you know, macro scale rod into a thin piece, but we also changed the structure because we changed the surface structure. Glass was just sitting in the air, it's being attacked by water in the air, and we have all these fine microscopic, you know, one-tenth the size of a human hair, uh, nicks and scratches in the surface, and those act as stress concentrators. If I were to take this glass fiber and I let this sit for an extended period of time, it'll eventually become brittle and I can't tie it in a knot anymore. So I changed the structure of the surface, of the interior, and the shape, and that allowed me to turn it from something which is going to break and require glasses to something that doesn't. And this is what materials engineering is about. So I'm Scott Beckman. I'm an associate professor of materials engineering in the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering. And I'm here to talk to you about materials engineering. So what's central to materials engineering is structure. And structure, that has you know, many different ideas. Uh, what's the smallest thing that you can structure if you're to start putting building blocks together? Atoms. What's smaller than atoms? Those a little bigger than quarks. <laughs> Electrons. Electrons. And at the smallest level, we design electrons, and, well, we don't design electrons, but we structure how they arrange themselves. And that's my area of research. I'm, you know, a quantum mechanician, and I design materials at the electronic level. But on this other end, we've got car doors. And between electrons and car doors, we have electrons, atoms, crystals. We have crystals that form microstructures. We have microstructures that form mesostructures, and then macrostructures and, and car doors. And this whole range of structures, they interrelate to each other. You change something down here, it has an impact on the car door. You change the shape of the car door, you need to change something in the atomic structure. Uh, materials engineering is about controlling the structure, because the structure gives us the properties, right? The structure is what changes the difference between breaking glass and bending glass. And that's what engineers do. Well, actually, engineers want these properties so in order to get those properties, we process materials. And I process this material with fire, which, by the way, is one of our favorite things in materials engineering. We process not everything, but as much as we can with fire, because it's, it's fun and it's pretty efficient. Uh, so we process materials to change the structure to control the properties. And I want to show you another demonstration. 
uh, looking at pro uh, properties and uh, processing. So these are uh, bobby pins. Right, I bought you know a pack of these for like for a buck. Uh, they all came off the same machine. They're extremely elastic. See, I try to pull them apart and they snap back together. Well, I can take this bobby pin and again go to our friend Fire and I'll heat it up until it's red hot and I'll quench it in water. Now that I've quenched it in water, I can take it and I pull it apart and it's brittle. Nothing changed in the composition. This isn't a chemistry problem. This is about the structure of the atoms and the structure of the crystals at the tip of this pin. And I go further, I can take this, a new one of these, they're all made on the same assembly line, heat it up, quench it, and now I'll heat it again, but just lightly. bobby pin, which is flexible. So the same material can be elastic, brittle, or plastic, and we can control that through controlling processing, which control the structure. And we can take this and we can look at the structure uh, at the tip of this, and we'll see a very discernible change. So materials, I, th I think, is, is a fantastic subject. You know, I've been in the field for 20 years, it's been great, uh, and I think that people don't realize exactly how integral they are to, well, I would say everything, but that's, it's a little even more than that, it's just who we are as a people. We, we, we talk about our, you know, society in terms of being in the, you know, the Stone Age, or the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, you know, now the Silicon Age. We are influenced in, in how we live our lives, how we interact with our children, uh, you know, how we just get along in life based on the materials that we have available to us. Uh, and I think people also don't realize how much materials design impacts their lives. Everything in this room you see, that's a material, which is you know, everything but the gas, uh, was designed by somebody. You know, the paint on the wall, someone had to design the paint. John Deere, I've got a student that graduated from my group, he works at John Deere. They have a whole division that studies paint. Because paint's important for corrosion prevention. You know, the light bulbs, the little uh, metal end caps, you know, some electrical engineer said, well, you know, we, we know, you know what type of current, what type of voltage we want on that. But someone had to design the metal that went into that. And in fact, I would say that materials is so important that whatever you do as an engineer, if you're doing something that's engaging and worthwhile, you're going to be a materials engineer. I mean, think about uh, civil engineering, right? Civil engineers, you know, they design parking lots, right? So there's a bunch of civil engineers that are going out making sure the ground's level, which, you know, not particularly exciting. But there are civil engineers that design the concrete. Concrete is a major producer of carbon dioxide. New concretes don't emit carbon dioxide, but they store carbon dioxide. So a civil engineer that's doing the cutting edge work, they're really materials engineers, right? Think about automobiles, right? What's the single greatest contributing factor to increasing the fuel efficiency of cars? It's not the gasoline. Yes, it's the weight. Lighter, stronger materials. This is uh, cast magnesium. I'm pass this around. Uh, in the future, I, I see it in my lifetime, we're going to have cars using cast magnesium. You know, as strong as steel, but you know, a tenth the weight. This is the future, and it's about the materials that the car is made of. Space planes. We've got do designs for dozens of space planes. We don't have a space plane because we don't have the materials. Landfills. Landfills are full of waste, but they're also full of precious metals. Why aren't we mining them? 
Well, because we don't have a separation process to separate the uh, valuable content from the waste from the toxic content. You know, recycling is a materials problem. So everything that is really impacting us, you know, in the past, you know, building, you know, better steel, you know, sharper swords, whatever, to the future, whether it is energy efficiency or uh, recycling, is about materials. And you can become any type of engineer you want, but I'll tell you that if you're doing cutting edge work, you will be a materials engineer. Am I selling this well? I hope so. Uh, so I, I've got one more demo I want to do before I, I pass it over to my colleagues in mechanical. <laughs> this, this is a wire. Well, I've got a bunch of wires, so I'm going to hand these out. This is a wire. It says, backwards, it says WSU. See, WSU. It's, uh, it's an alumni wire because we train them. In fact, I trained these myself yesterday. I trained it to say WSU. And uh, it's ready to go out in the world, and I want to send these home with you. But these wires, they uh, are going to go out in the world, and they're going to experience different stresses. And with these stresses, they're going to get you know, out of shape and out of place. You could say you don't. <laughs> they can't say that because it's alumni. <laughs> so, eventually, we know what's going to happen. Here it is. And I'm getting my tea kettle going, but uh, it's a little bit slow, so I'll use fire instead because we all like fire. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to use fire, by the way, when you hand these home. Uh, you just need hot water over 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, you take this and I warm it up slightly. And it comes back to WSU. It's alumni wire. Now, this is a, it's a shape memory alloy. It's Everybody called. Comes back to WSU. Yeah, we hope so. <laughs> um, it's, it's a shape memory alloy. It's called nitinol. The structure of this, uh, it has a bunch of little crystals in it that are all accordion like. It, it looks a lot like a bendy straw. And when I take and I deform it, it's like taking that bendy straw and uh, pulling it out, right? You're deforming those bends. As I heat it up, it goes to a third crystal structure, and when it cools back down, it goes back to that original accordion shape. So these nitinol wires, these nitinol wires, uh, you can understand what's happening in terms of uh, their love of WSU, and in terms of and in terms of their uh, structure. This is a, a phase transition that's occurring. And uh, at home, you can just put it in hot water. It has to be 105 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and it, it should <coughs> transform back. So uh, I'll pass this over to uh, Arda and uh, we'll sugar tea. So mine's not as exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll show you this. Um, so I'm Arda Gus, and I'm an assistant professor at mechanical engineering. Um, so mechanical engineering is really broad. Uh, I mean, I, I can only maybe talk about one hand of it. Um, so, in WSU Mechanical Engineering, actually, we, we acknowledge that. We have a variety of faculty working on different areas. And actually, our program um, will be shifting to what we call a track model, where uh, students will start off at the same location, basically, um, and then will select their path in terms of what branch of mechanical engineering they want to specialize in. Uh, and and uh, just to give you guys some examples, we're going to have a thermofluidics track, which uh, eventually, you know, if you go to that track, you'll have job opportunities in the areas like energy, um, aerospace, uh, HVAC, many, many other examples. And I'm not the expert, so I'm not going to try to push it any further. Um, we're going to have a manufacturing and design path, which I can talk a little bit more about. Um, and, uh, uh, and then finally, we're going to have a robotics and, and controls track. Um, so if you're interested in robotics, uh, more interdisciplinary work between electronics, engineering, computer science, um, you'll have a chance to go on that track as well. So I myself, um, I do research in manufacturing, I teach manufacturing, I also have some background in robotics, 
in what we call mechatronics, which is a combination of um, electrical science, electrical engineering, computer science, and mechanical engineering. So, uh, with manufacturing, uh, we have a recent initiative going on. So, obviously, you can appreciate all this talk about, oh, where, where are the manufacturing jobs going, right? Um, are they going to India? Are they going to China? Uh, here, as mechanical engineering people, we, we have to acknowledge that some of those manufacturing jobs, for instance, are not going anywhere. They're just disappearing. Um, why do you guys think they're disappearing? Any ideas? Robotics. Sorry? Robotics. Robotics. Now a job done by a certain, you know, labor force, a lot of stuff, can be very efficiently done by robots that can work 24-7 without getting tired, can work much faster, much more accurately, right? Um, and, uh, and as mechanical engineering people, we are lucky because we are in the position to control those robots. If you come to mechanical engineering, I'm not saying you're going to be the master of robots, I'm just saying. Um, so, <laughs> for instance, uh, I teach a class right now in, uh, it's, a, it's a senior elective, and that'll be a part of the manufacturing track once we start implementing in full 2020. And, and this class is called Manufacturing Automation, and um, a part of the class we talk about industrial robots, uh, from their building blocks, the simple, you know, parts and, and motors and how you select them, how you put them together, some basic calculations associated with their operation. And our students get to have a hands-on opportunity in our lab sessions. So I'm going to show you a video. that This was recorded on Thursday um, in a lab session. Oh, not this one. This one's a few years ago. So, so let me give you a little bit of a context here. Turning on the projector first, hopefully. Take no one to warm up. I believe. There you go. So, um, so in this lab, they're working with a desktop industrial robot, and they are learning their operation principles, how to control them, some about their programming, but also uh, I teach them uh, the concept of machine vision. Uh, which basically how robots see and interpret the information. So when you think about a manufacturing plant, right, uh, and robots these days can actually identify, there's a sorting operation, you have five different types of product, a robot can look at the product and see if it's a certain size of bolt or a different size of bolt and be able to put them in different bins. And the way you do the way they do that is they look at the parts and they understand through the visual processing which part goes where, right? So I'm teaching them the fundamentals of that, and they're, they're uh, applying that in the lab session. So in this case, the goal is for the robot to um, wait until you place in front of it this piece of foam, it represents a workpiece, um, and has those colorful dots on it, which pretty much tells the robot where this thing is, okay? And I teach them how to distinguish between a red, green, and blue. Not them, but how to how I teach them how to teach the robots to figure out what red is, right? So the idea is for the robot to pick that up, turn 90 degrees, wait for another set of dots to be put in front of it, identify its orientation, turn the workpiece such that it matches the orientation of the card and place right on top of it. So So th this is a weekly lab session that they have to finish basically within a few hours and then walk them through different steps of doing it, but they eventually accomplished by the students. And just another note, this particular video was sent to me by two a, team, a group of two students, both female. One of them is a star volleyball player and the other one does rugby and rowing. So we have a very diverse group of students we're not anywhere near the you know amount of participation, especially from from women, uh, but we are working really hard to get there. Um, I just don't want to take a lot more time and want to open the floor for your questions before we run out of time. For both me and Scott. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, do you have an automotive engineering crap? We do not, no. But um, different tracks will give you opportunities. I mean, both robotics and manufacturing and design track will give you opportunities to learn quite a bit about the fundamentals of automotive engineering. And we have, we have a lot of flexibility in our program so that you can really design what you want. And you know, if you come in, you do the minimum, you're going to get the minimum degree, and you don't want that. The joke is, what do you call the last person? The person who graduates last in their you know, class in medical school? Doctor. And it, it's funny, but not at the same time. Uh, but the same thing is true of engineers. Uh, come in and, and know what you want to do. Think about, you know, I want to go to automotive, or I want to go to aerospace, or I want to go to, you know, you know full roll takes, and, and whatever that is, uh, you can do that here. Because uh, we have the flexibility built in, and we have uh, the availability. And in terms of automotive, we have uh, many of our students taking internships with places like PACAR mm -hmm. uh, and, and elsewhere in, in the state. Uh, we've got contact with Boeing, uh, SpaceX, uh, Microsoft's got a big battery plant coming about now. Uh, and our, our students routinely have, have uh, internships with places like that. Uh, we have close relationships with, the, with, with those companies. Um, we have member, a number of people from Boeing, a uh, number of people from Microsoft, for instance, um, Amazon. We have those people in our advisory board, and we meet once every semester and talk about what they expect from us. So we're, we're always continuously looking to align our program with the needs of the local industry so that you guys can find jobs easily. And a lot of opportunities also to work with faculty here. So I think most faculty have undergrads in their lab. I've got currently four. Uh, I don't know how many do you have right now. Five or six. Five or six. Yeah. Just trying. And students come in and they say, you know, I really want to. Like, for example, I've got a student that's interested in uh, aerospace actually, and I say, well, you know, I, I do theory, but he's doing design of at the molecular level, and that's giving him experience with design, experience with you know, project completion, uh, experience with you know, bonding, and then that's going to you know, bootstrap him into. Uh, other internships and other career opportunities. More questions? Do you have any examples of like what you would do in a lab for mechanical engineering specifically? In terms of research? Uh, or just you know? Oh, like just hands-on. Hands yeah, hands-on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. So um, again, I'm more related to manufacturing. We have a manufacturing processes class, which is at the junior level. And there you go in and you start by using manual mill machines, manual plates. Um, you go ahead and machine out pieces yourself. Uh, you start with that and then you learn how to program uh, computer numerical control machines to actually make much more intricate parts by cutting through uh, metal. And then you practice in 3D printing. You use 3D printers to make certain parts. Um, and then you, you, you get exposed to some other manufacturing processes like injection molding and so on and so forth. Um, other than that, we have uh, another example that I can think of is via 406. It's a senior level class. Um, more involves designing different type of experiments associated with different tracks that we talked about. I mean, for instance, something about the, the flow of air, uh, something about, you know, thermal science. There's a bunch of different experiments that students go in and run those experiments to learn how to write uh, the proper reports for it and then describe their um, uh, basically findings. Um, what other labs? I teach mechatronics. Um, I'm going to show it. <laughs> I'm just so proud. So this was from our mechatronics class. This is where we teach the students to um, the principles of robotics, basically. So this robot is what it's trying to do is to find its way through a maze, um, trying not to hit the wall. So it's this one is a front tinker, so it actually figures out the center of the path. That's why it looks around a lot and figures it out, makes its calculations, and then starts moving. And obviously, it doesn't, it shouldn't hit the walls, and these saw the wall, and now it's going back and forth. Um, yeah, so when it needs to take a turn, it stops and takes a turn. So this is our midterm project. So the students build this from scratch. We teach them about different components that they need to put together. And, uh, and eventually, they make this happen. And this was one of the projects, and it's a maze project. But um, this is, a, again, a senior level class that all students will have to take.
Well, with the tracks, I think if you go into robotics, you will definitely take it and maybe manufacturing or design. But currently, it's a good one. Um, so those are some examples. We have more stuff, obviously. In material science, we have more labs, which are related to most of the stuff that Scott was talking about. Um, and we also have student organizations that are, are very oh, involved. Yeah. You know, so the, the Materials Advantage program, uh, they just went to the Material Science and Technology Conference, and there was a competition making, uh, they made domes here, and then they crushed them in a the hydraulic press. So they had one dome, which was going to be concrete, and one which was going to be aluminum. And these were geo ge geodesic domes, so they're looking at uh, brittle failure and uh, ductile failure. But all the different schools from around the country came to the same conference, and the students got a network there, and uh, got involved in, in making things on campus. And with the uh, mechanical engineering, what, what are the organizations they have? 3D Printing Club. I'm the advisor, so if you come to WSC, you come find me. I'm going to hook you up with the 3D Printing Club. We have a robotics club associated with the VCA in general, the, the college, but a lot of mechanical engineering activity going on. Aerospace Club, Coogs in Space, <laughs> daily. <laughs> not joking. We're not, we're not there yet, but you know, they're working on basically how to control satellites and stuff like that. So these are all student-run organizations, and they are very active. There are many opportunities along with research. You can come and volunteer to work in a lab, and you know. There's a danger of being sucked into grad school, which happened a lot in my lab. But uh, if you, WSU is an interdisciplinary place with the material science and mechanical engineering coming together. We emphasize research a lot. So that gives undergraduate students the opportunity to be exposed to it. You either go in a research direction in grad school or not. It is a great experience for you guys. It's right in front of you. And all of our faculty are receptive. Yeah, there's a lot of interplay between mechanical and materials. Like Arda and I, we've got a, a project we're working on together. We've got students that go back and forth between our labs. You know, my group does the theory, and, and we're doing some data science work. His group is actually making 3D uh, polymer ceramic uh, nanocomposites that are doing 3D printing. So, uh, What's the ratio of uh, students to faculty in, in, in this department? I mean, how, how much access do the, do the undergrads have to you guys? Versus, yeah. In, in materials, we have, I think we graduate about 25 students a year, and we've got around 15 faculty. So in, in class, you know, we know your name. We know you and don't show up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the campus is bigger. Oh, well, I'm not going to lie. We're not even close to that. Right? So we have, you know, 1,000 to 30, 40 kind of a deal here. So our classes end up getting big. Um, we're working on to change that quite a bit. But, but what happens is, as you go further in the program, especially when you get to the senior year, I mean, I can say confidently that I, I would know about two-thirds of, I mean, I, I would have a somewhat of a relationship with the two-thirds of my class. And they can come to me and ask, hey, you know, I'm applying a job here. Well, how do you think I should prepare? And I would be receptive. It. Our faculty members would be receptive to it. Yeah. So we, we do our best to mitigate. I mean, we have a large number of student body. We cannot deny that, and this is state school at the end of the day. Uh, but but we, we do our best to, to make sure that students get the best experience. So I, I, I teach the MSE 201 class, which is uh, intro to material science for both mechanical and materials engineering students. And we have you know, usually around 160 students per semester in that class. But there's usually about 20, 30 of them that I get to know because they're engaged. And again, it comes down to what you get out of your time at school, whether it's this school or any other school, is equivalent to what you put into it. If you come here, you do the minimum, you'll get out with the minimum. And you know, you'll probably have a good life, I hope. But uh, those, of us, those of you that you'll see again in the future because you're successful and you become part of our external advisory board, uh, those are the ones that were engaged as undergrads. They were involved in the student club, they were involved in research. Uh, we got to know people because they came to office hours. And I tell people this in my class all the time, come to office hours. You're not paying for me to read you a textbook. You can do that yourself, presumably. Uh, but uh, you're paying because I have 20 years of experience in the field, and you want to learn something new. And you want to learn something that's not in the textbook. And all of us, you know, Arda, we've all you know, had real-life engineering projects. and. 
I could talk for hours about any topic in material, pretty much, because I had so many different uh, problems I've worked on. Uh, and we're all want to do that. I mean, faculty, if we went to industry, we'd be making twice the amount we're making now. We're here because we like working with students, we like teaching class, uh, we like interesting problems that in industry are a little bit more focused than they are at the university. So we're here because we want to be here, and a big part of us wanting to be here it involves uh, you guys, or at least those of you that are engaged. Those that are engaged sit in the back of the class, they turn things in late and leave. Well, you know, we'll get by with you the same way <laughs> you get by with us. But those of you that are engaged, we, we engage with you. We'll infect you with our passion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have business cards here if you guys want to pick up um, and reach me with any questions, anytime. Yeah, we're, we're both on the website, so. Yeah. You look the same, slightly grayer here. So. <laughs> 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 Forty-five yesterday. Oh, what, you are forty-five. Oh, okay. Thirty-five. <laughs> All, right, All right. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna just follow me this way. Go to the code for the panel sessions that we have. Good. Thank you.